attention to the plight of our oceans, and it is a very much a pleasure uh, to have you here with us today. So I'm very excited about this next roundtable discussion uh, where we will talk about why the sectoral approach is a promising mechanism for supporting the actions of developing nations with assistance from developed nations. Support could come through technology transfer, sharing of best practices, market-based approaches to reducing emissions, or other actions that provide mutually beneficial outcomes. Sectoral approaches can complement ongoing efforts to create a highly credible offset market under the clean development mechanism. They provide additional tools to work with economy-wide emissions caps that have been set locally or through the United Nations international negotiations. Our discussion of, <clears throat> excuse me, of sectoral approaches targets the highest emitting sectors of the economy where there are opportunities for us to work together to reduce emissions. In the energy sector, the opportunities to share best practices on energy efficiency and build from our existing partnerships are many. In the transportation sector, developed countries can learn from our partners in developing countries and improve our transit and rail systems. In the cement, iron, steel, and aluminum sectors, international collaboration is paramount as these commodities are bought and sold without regard to state, provincial, and national borders. The forestry and agriculture sectors provide many opportunities for sequestering carbon and ensuring that we can adapt to the deleterious impacts of climate change. So to further delve into this topic, I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Mr. Steve Howard, CEO and co-founder of the Climate Group. And Steve is also a member of the World Economic Forum's Carbon Standards Disclosure Board and is an advisor to the Virgin Earth Challenge. We're pleased to have Steve moderating this discussion. And I would like now to invite the panelists to please join us on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, I think we're going to have a fantastic panel discussion this afternoon, a very lively one. We've got a very eminent panel. I'm going to introduce the, the panel and then uh, set up the session, and then we'll get straight into to people's comments. Um, first of all, to uh, our left, not been introduced formally yet today, Linda Adams, uh, obviously the, the secretary of Cal EPA, but a, a really internationally recognized leader on the environment. And somebody said to me recently that the world needs um, enlightened men and brave women to tackle this challenge. So uh, I would say you're both enlightened and brave, Linda. And as, as one of the things, uh, one of the things in your term as Cal Secretary to have to, uh, Cal EPA Secretary, to actually be the lead negotiator on AB 32, I think is, you know, it's a historic piece of legislation. And, and, and very important to have done. I know you're also the first, the first woman secretary as well, and I'm sure not the last, having blazed the trail there. Uh, next to uh, Linda, uh, Ambassador Pangratis from the European Commission. Uh, the ambassador has held many different positions, really, and actually, if we locked him in a room by himself, he could actually negotiate with himself and come up <laughs> uh, with the next, the next agreement uh, to follow on from Kyoto because he's dealt with trade, external affairs, a whole range of issues, and from Argentina to South Korea, I believe. Um, then we go to uh, uh, Zhang uh, Kofi Marlow, who's senior policy advisor for the OECD. The OECD has 30 member countries, so when the OECD speaks, it speaks with a voice of 30 countries. Uh, and uh, Jan is the the senior policy advisor with climate change as her brief. Uh, 
Mark Stewart. Mark is uh, a, a co-founder of EcoSecurities. Uh, we should give EcoSecurities a brief thanks because they have offset this conference. Uh, and Mark's uh, business now, I think you have something like 265 people or something around the world actually involved in getting their sleeves rolled up, making projects happen and making money flow to emissions reductions. Uh, next we've got uh, Dr. Jayant Sate. Uh, Dr. Sate is uh, our, I forgot a second, our second Nobel laureate, I actually say, because he's uh, like, like uh, Jan, he's uh, on the IPCC. Uh, which received the Nobel Prize, as we know, uh, along with Al Gore last year. Um, and uh, an eminent expert from Lawrence Berkeley, and uh, is very much focused on uh, energy efficiency, but many other things beside. Uh, and then we go to, to Dr. Yang, Dr. Yang from Energy Foundation in Beijing. Uh, the Energy Foundation in Beijing has been at the heart, really, I think, of, of, of uh, working from a civil society's perspective in China on advancing discussions around policy, from very specific levels down to air conditioning standards through to how you deliver low, low emission zone in, in China. Uh, then next we go over to, uh, to Dan. I've lost my place, so we are. We've not known each other long. We only had a, a moment before. Uh, to Dan Klein. Uh, Dan is the project manager for the Centre for Clean Air Policy. Uh, the Centre for Clean Air Policy, I think, has probably worked with more countries internationally. It was involved in the European Emissions Trading Scheme, advising uh, the European Commission and some of the countries in Europe on the development of the ETS, but has also has done processes with as many as 20, I think, developing countries, actually talking through what possible positions could be there. So uh, CCAP is, a, is very well respected in this space. Uh, then over to, to Mike Sweeney. Mike's from TNC. I actually have to, have to say one of the more interesting uh, an unusual, uh, I don't think anybody I've met has worked for the, an advisor to the Japanese diet and for the Clinton-Gore campaign. You must be the, the only one in that space, Mike. Uh, but here is to talk very much about forestry from TNC's point of view. Uh, and lastly, over to, uh, to, Gru, to Drew Kojak, who's the executive director for the International Council on Clean Transpora Transportation, um, which is an exciting, relatively new network, three and a half years old, that's actually looking at how can you advance policy around transportation and have clean transportation there. And I think sort of new, there's something called global action networks, I believe, which are really action-orientated collaborative networks, not sort of traditional issues-based NGOs, uh, and your organization is very much one of those. So that's a, a great panel. Uh, now, just to tee things up, um, I'm just really struck. I'm, I'm going to take a, a one-moment liberty just to say that I was really struck by the, the opening remarks here from California's very own emissions terminator, Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, and his remarkable leadership. But now it looks like we're about to have an emissions terminator in D.C. Uh, yeah. And on the issue of climate change, I mean, the climate group works, uh, California was one of our founding partners, and we work with city, states, and businesses around the world from New York to California to South Australia, from, from China Mobile to BP, uh, around climate leadership. And uh, when the outside world was looking at the US, uh, myself and many other people, I can see our co-founder, Michael Northrop from Rockefeller Fellow Brothers Fund, have been saying, no, look at all the action at state level. Look at the leadership at uh, city level that's in the US. Look at the tremendous response from, from many leaders on this issue. Um, and because people were looking very much at the U.S., but now, now we have a situation where we have the full force of America, so welcome back, America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we're all, we can't stop. We're all required. So we'll now move into the panel conversation, and we're going to focus around how can we actually use act, action at the sector level to really drive change, what's important, important at sectoral action, and how can you do things that are scalable, that will have a real long-term impact, but are actually short-term effects as well. Uh, and to set the scene, I'm going to turn, first of all, to uh, Ambassador Pangratis. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for this um, excellent introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I also want to thank the organizers for inviting the European Commission to present parts of um, what the uh, policy of the European Union in this important area is. 
Uh, it's a particular pleasure to be uh, in California, of course, a state with a recognized leadership in environment and climate change issues. Let me try to give you in a few minutes the state of play of our thinking concerning the theme of the day, uh, the sectoral approaches. I think we have to start with um, one very uh, important uh, point, and this point has to be uh, the fact that it's very important to talk about um, state initiatives, regional initiatives, sectoral approaches, all that. All of it, every piece of it is extremely important. The bottom line and the essence of the challenge that we are facing is that all that at some stage at the policy making has to come together, has to come together at the level of uh, each of our nations and uh, even more globally in uh, uh, pursuing objectives that can collectively make us able to face the challenge that we are facing. Um, the uh, European uh, nations, the member states of the European Union have uh, done that. Uh, we have defined the uh, objectives that we believe uh, give the measure of the challenge. We know what we need to do collectively uh, in order to uh, meet the challenge. We have uh, defined uh, objectives for ourselves. Um, uh, objectives of reduction of uh, our emissions, uh, emissions uh, reductions that we will pursue autonomously and we hope very much that we will pursue in agreement with uh, all others. And I think it's important uh, to uh, take this as the starting point. It's certainly our starting point. When we look at the issue of sectoral approaches, our uh, natural starting point is how can these sectoral approaches help or, or, uh, our overall process of policy making? How can they make us more able to meet the challenge? Now, in um, our panoply of instruments and tools to uh, pursue our objectives of, uh, 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 of, em of emission reduction, the more important instrument that we have is the uh, ETS, the Emission Trading Scheme. This um, idea of a carbon market was not originally a European idea. Uh, it uh, started in the process of the Kyoto negotiation. It was, in fact, an American idea. We looked into it, uh, we uh, developed it, and I think we are now leading the way with uh, a functioning, efficient ETS uh, market. And now we are having this other very interesting idea, this uh, sectoral uh, approaches um, that we believe um, gives hope and open doors and possibility, possibilities for the future. So I would like to tell you briefly why are we exploring actively the sectoral approaches? Because that's what we are doing. Why do we believe that this is a promising idea and how do we proceed in trying to advance uh, the uh, sectoral approaches? Why be we believe it's a promising idea? There are at least two uh, important uh, reasons. First, the sectoral approaches uh, provide the opportunity for responses to special challenges that our current ETS system uh, has. Uh, you all know the debate. I don't need to explain this uh, in great detail of the energy intensive industries, um, particularly sectors where the goods produced by these energy intensive industries are traded uh, globally. The solution for the time being that we are promoting in our own system is uh, through uh, allowance uh, allocation, to a very great extent, free allowances. Uh, the uh, sectoral approaches open a, um, uh, a, a new door. They uh, create the hope that we can find methods to mitigate those uh, challenges. Uh, you can easily uh, understand the argument uh, through an appropriate sectoral approach on these uh, sectors. We can increase the standards, the requirements, coordinate, have a more coherent uh, basis uh, worldwide and thus um, provide a long-term uh, uh, answer to these challenges of the current system. Second, very important aspect, why these sectoral approaches? Uh, 
uh, uh, are very promising is that we believe that they can provide the responses to the key challenges of the post-2012 regime. The, probably the more uh, difficult uh, issue in uh, defining the post-2012 regime, now that we know that we will have a U.S. government that we will be a proactive actor and a cooperative partner in that uh, context, is the definition of the commitment of the uh, developing countries. How much can the emerging, particularly countries, uh, commit and how much uh, both the developing countries and the developed countries can have confidence in the mutual commitment so that we can move forward and find a global deal that uh, makes sense. So through the sectoral uh, approaches, we believe that we have very important arguments, arguments towards the developed uh, countries. The developed countries, um, you know, recognize, and I think it's a fact of life, that uh, developing countries cannot get full ETS systems. It's a big debate. I'm sure all of you who follow this discussion, uh, you know that. Uh, there is no data. There is no way to have it practically uh, operating. Well, through sectoral approaches, there is the hope that if we get it right, if we find the right methods, uh, developing countries can make much greater commitments than are otherwise. And, of course, these greater commitments will have to come as a result of incentives. It has to be on the basis of win-win uh, proposals, and this can give confidence to developed countries to uh, take commitments themselves. You know, you have followed most of you the debate that we had between EU and the uh, US about how much these emerging countries can commit and how much uh, uh, the developed countries have to lead the way because we do have to lead the way in taking um, more important commitments, of course. Uh, to the uh, developing countries, the um, sectoral approach gives a, a, a very interesting uh, message, which is that we can find ways uh, where uh, increase of uh, energy uh, efficiency uh, can happen in an efficient and a sustainable uh, uh, way. Um, developing countries can clearly uh, uh, benefit from uh, incentives that can be uh, developed around the uh, sectoral approach. Uh, the same way we have seen that industry within developing and within developed countries see the benefits of sectoral approaches. And we have examples, and I'm sure the panel we mentioned uh, several of those. In developing countries, the opportunities to benefit from support in this context, it's obvious. In uh, developed uh, countries, the industry knows that they have to face uh, emission cuts, and as, that, and as such, um, sectoral approaches give them the opportunity to cut emissions in developing countries with uh, less cost or to purchase emissions, uh, emission rights from developing countries or to uh, spread, improve the standards, and thus uh, uh, promote their long-term uh, competitiveness. Um, there are several examples of uh, sectoral approaches initiated by uh, the industry, and of course, uh, this needs to be built upon and expand. Now, how do we promote that? Very briefly. Uh, how to, do, do we promote the sectoral um, approaches? Because we believe that there are very important promises in that. We have started a process that we call it a study. In fact, it's more than uh, a study. We hope that we will have the, uh, the first results um, in, in fact, in the coming days uh, prior to Poznan uh, that will give the proof of the concept that it can operate, that it can be uh, useful. Then we hope to have final, the final results uh, before uh, Copenhagen. And in fact, in the process, it's not just a study. We hope to generate uh, around this study process uh, support from industry as well as from both developed and developing countries. I just mention, and I finish with that, the, um, the key aims of the uh, study as we have defined, it, defined them and gave them to the um, teams that, uh, in fact, are performing those tasks. The key aims is to engage key emerging economies such as China, India, Mexico, Brazil in the merits of sectoral approaches gain support 
by important players in this country is getting commitments from other developed nations that this approach would be a, an, an interesting, equitable way for developing nations to contribute. We need to, uh, to have the, the concept accepted by developed nations that it's an acceptable formula for the developing countries uh, to uh, contribute. And we have uh, developed a very important effort to define, try to define how the sectoral approaches can be combined with uh, the ETS, our trading scheme, which is, the, as I said, the basic instrument uh, that uh, we have to reach our uh, uh, emission reduction objectives. And uh, we have already, as a result of this uh, um, study, we believe that there is a very interesting uh, approach to develop uh, further that could result in kind of sectoral crediting. The idea is very simple. Instead of having the CDMs project by project offsets, have a kind of uh, definition uh, which is sectoral and which could allow uh, developing countries to uh, uh, benefit um, from reaching these objectives or doing better than those objectives. And this could be compatible and even feed into a, 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 an ETS. And, um, of course, in all this uh, process, one important aspect of the study is to find the appropriate ways uh, through which the competitiveness of the EU uh, industry can be guaranteed. It's not creating distortions, in fact. It's not creating carbon leakages. So, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> these very brief uh, ideas, I think they are very uh, important. And... Um, in, uh, on the issue of, uh, of sectoral um, approach, uh, approaches, I think we can say that our study <coughs> has already confirmed the potential, the potential, I repeat, to complement the existing ET ETS uh, mechanism in getting results in CO emissions in a sustainable way, and probably even more importantly, to have a very important contribution in defining uh, the parameters and allowing more important commitments by the developing countries in the post-2012 regime. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thanks, Ambassador. And I, I know we, we were talking uh, over lunch, actually, about the fact that the ETS in Europe is actually a sector-based scheme in a way because it deals with a couple of sectors and... Uh, and, uh, Jan, you were going to talk some more, actually focus on the ETS in some detail, weren't you? So over, over to you. So thank you. Uh, first, I should start by saying I'd like to thank the organizers for including the OECD on behalf of my Secretary General, Angel Guerrilla, who would have liked to have been here but could not, given his other uh, commitments. So I, I do think there are a number of examples where we have successful sectoral collaboration, uh, but the, I would like to focus on the EU emission trading scheme because it has, in fact, been a, a fabulous success. And there is some recent work which uh, I could point you to that's from Frank Convery and Denny Ellerman and others, uh, in part led of, out of MIT, which is now an ex post assessment of the first phase of the uh, European Emission Trading Scheme. So that, <clears throat> that scheme is, in fact, interesting uh, in part because it is an example of a, a broad-based scheme, uh, in some ways cutting across sectors, but very much focused on the power and uh, large industry sectors in Europe. In itself, it is a, uh, an international, an example of international collaboration where we saw 27 countries and 23 different languages and essentially cultural approaches to uh, the environment and climate change combined uh, into a single system uh, representing uh, the population across which that system uh, uh, exists is about a half a billion people. So it's quite uh, a large system and has had to um, work across uh, cultural divides. And so in many ways, a good example, I think, of collaboration. So the system itself uh, is estimated by uh, Convery et al. to have uh, achieved a 25 to 5% emission reduction below baseline in the initial period 2002-2004. 
And I'd like to remind you that this system did not exist prior to the Kyoto Protocol, it did not exist in the uh, first part of, of this century in 2000. By 2002, it was in place. So that's a spectacularly fast uh, movement by a large uh, multi-international uh, organization to be able to put such a system in place. And just since I'm sitting next to Ambassador Pangratis, commend the EU for that work. Um, of course, they did not do that in, on their own, and I think, in fact, it would have been uh, virtually impossible to have create, created such a system without some groundwork. And some of that groundwork was indeed laid in the United States with a successful acid rain uh, regulation, and uh, also prior to that, uh, regulation of lead, uh, where markets were created and used to stimulate innovation and bring emissions down. Uh, the systems, like the EU ETS, uh, uh, the emission trading system, actually depends on the establishment of a solid legal foundation to establish unambiguous emission rights, reliable and transparent accounting for emissions. We heard a lot about that this morning. And then also transparent transaction, tracking of transactions so the market players can know what's going on. And uh, n not last but least, a strong compliance system, so a big stick to punish those who exceed limits and to reward those who stay within their limits. I think importantly in the uh, European system, what we saw it was uh, a need for and actually building into the system of learning by doing. So there was a phase one, phase two, phase, now we're moving into phase three. In phase one was a pilot system intended to learn. And that's really important to get started early. We can't solve this problem um, with full foresight. We have to learn as we go. So, uh, and interestingly, when I was visiting and moving around in various policy circles in California for some research I was doing in 2005, I was told by many of the people, the policy elites here in California, that that system was failing. That was a perception, I think, in faraway places. I said, my response was, wait and watch, because the market, yes, it was unstable. There were periods when prices dropped nearly to zero. And my, I think the person next to me is actually marked an expert, so I won't speak too much about how those markets work. But in fact, what, what we saw was some of that learning going on. And as uh, the market players have learned to work within this system, what we have seen is a more stable price emerging. And we're also seeing, uh, as I said, some significant success. So I just want to make uh, a couple of quick points. I'm going to draw to a close. I know we're short for time here. That uh, the reason I think the system uh, was uh, developed and has been a success and will continue to deliver results is be in part because policymakers believed in the design and use of markets to generate an ongoing uh, dynamic signal for innovation over time, and that they created the legal regulatory frameworks for those markets to develop and for the private sector to take charge of this and, and ownership to own this problem and to create some of the solutions. And that, uh, at least for me, from where I sit looking at international collaboration for the last 20 years, I think it is a true example of learning from each other and that I hope we can continue to share those experiences and impart this effort that California has, has uh, spurred today is, I think, helpful for the rest of the world to learn not only from California but from other states and other sub-national, if you will, non-state actors who are very much part of this dynamic process to respond to climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Mark, so we've, I mean, there's lots of talk around the, the clean development mechanism and it's a, a glass, glass either half full or half empty, depending on perspective, or uh, you're going to touch on this. Uh, I'll do my best. First of all, I'd like to thank the Governor and uh, Secretary Adams and uh, Mary Nichols from CARB for giving us the opportunity to participate in this conference and to contribute a little bit by the offsetting, and for those nice people from UC Berkeley, I'd like to note I carpooled here, so cut that in half when you do this calculation. Um, I was very pleased, almost every, almost every participant in both panels today has talked about the power of carbon markets, uh, which is something a bit of a surprise if you spent time in the U.S. and in California over the last couple of years. Markets have not necessarily had the same 
positive name here that they have in, in Europe and in, and in the rest of the world. And um, I think Dr. Pensog from Environmental Defense would be surprised perhaps to learn that I agree with many of her critiques of the current way that the CDM and the markets are working. And there are some needs for some substantial reforms, particularly to make this more broad-based mechanism in terms of mobilizing capital flows. But it's probably worthwhile. We talk a lot about the clean development mechanism, but there are many people who are not not quite as aware. Just to quickly run through exactly what the, what the positive things are before I you know, go back and start talking about some of the things that we need to improve. There are more than 3,000 projects in the clean development mechanism right now. They represent forward emission reductions over the, just the next five years of between one and a half and two billion tons, and it will continue to reduce emissions beyond that. This represents tens of billions of dollars worth of investment capital and transactions moving forward. When we talk about, you know, how collaboration works, let's not forget that the way humankind organizes itself is around markets. We organize all of our consumption, all of our production around the use of markets. So that we are doing that around the, the, the market of the, or the, you know, trying to protect the atmosphere is not that surprising and may be one of the only ways we can, um, we can actually mobilize the types of capital we need to. I think the point, further point to make is that the CDM has globally created, you know, a class of what you might call low carbon entrepreneur. I mean, all these projects have people behind them that are consistently looking for ways to reduce emissions. And that's something that is a qualitative benefit that is sometimes overlooked when people criticize the nuts and bolts of the CDM or the exactness of particular tons that have been, you know, that have been created in terms of reduction. So let's take a little step back and realize that in 10 short years since Kyoto, we have had a sea change in the world's viewpoint on how emissions work, particularly in play, far off places that you wouldn't necessarily think are particularly environmentally conscious in, in parts of the extremely poor developing world. Now we need to look at how, you know, how we take this. You know, we, we, the CDM is very much a project-based mechanism, and this panel is talking about uh, how we move towards more of a sectoral approach. And what, really, a sectoral approach within, within the CDM, it exists, it's something called programmatic CDM, but it has been built, dealt with so convolutedly, is the way I would put it, that it's virtually had no uptake. And is that a fault of the CDM? Is that a fault of the sectoral approach, or is that a fault of just the way that we've tried to shove, how would you put it, a round peg into a square hole. And I think that the, the, my answer would be that we, we, can, we can find ways to manage the current, manage the system in a way, not necessarily the current system, but an evolution of the system, to a way where we can start out moving these types of capital flows that we've seen in the project-based mechanisms to more of a, more of a sectoral-based, more of a sectoral-based approach. And our challenge is to, is to, is to meld that, is to, is to understand that the types of policies around forestry and around transportation, around building, that some of the other panelists are going to speak to, that these policies are ultimately just policies. And to make these things work, you know, at the scale and, frankly, at the speed we need to, to make them work to, in order to avoid dangerous climate change, we are going to need to mobilize, continue to mobilize enormous amounts of capital. And just setting a policy does not guarantee uh, the type of results that you want. I mean, there are, I can give you enormous numbers of policies around the developing world that have been in place very nicely for managing landfills and uh, having, you know, energy efficiency and whatever that are completely ignored. And the reason for that is that from a cost, you know, from a cost-benefit basis from either the participant or from the government in question, it makes no sense to... Uh, to, to undertake them. So ultimately, if we are going to make this work, we have to find ways that policies enable capital flows, okay? And the capital flows we're talking about are enormous. And we do not have unlimited capital. I mean, people often bring up the idea of setting up green funds and setting up uh, sort of taxation systems and things like that. Yes, there may be sectors and there may be areas which that should be a significant part, part of it. Don't, don't deny it whatsoever. But nonetheless, let's remember, we as a, you know, as a human society are down somewhere between 5 and $10 trillion in the last couple months in regards to the amount of capital we have to allocate towards, uh, towards these types of activities. And we need, to, we need to make sure that the activities we do undertake are, are, are focused on making sure we get the most environmental benefit in the terms of greenhouse gases for the types of investments we make. With that, I, I think that, you know, it will probably be more, more useful for me to sort of, you know, respond to some of the further questions later on in regards to the ways that we think the, you know, CDM or similar mechanism could work. The one thing I would say is that the CDM has been extraordinarily focused on being exact, 
when we start moving towards programmatic or sectoral approaches, we need to start moving towards being conservative. If we think that there are, you know, I'll just give an example, 100 tons being, being reduced and we don't know exactly, the idea of crediting 50, 60, or 70 according to the data that we actually have is better than nothing. Okay, and the problem is we have the sense that, or I have a sense that sometimes people want to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to the CDM, and I think that given the successes it has, that would be, you know, extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily short-sighted. With that, I will, did I make my time? You did. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Mark. I reminded people the Gettysburg Address was only four minutes long. Um, so they, they just, somebody said people were still shooting at Lincoln then there. Um, right, we're going to go more specific now and actually go, I think that was a really good introduction on the role of the, role of the market and actually the fact, I think, Mark, your point that policies need to mobilise capital flows uh, at scale uh, for us to actually do this is a point well made. Uh, but now moving over to sort of collaboration actually on a sector around the electric power sector. Uh, to you, Dr. Sade. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, also, Linda, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. It's great to be here. Uh, so the story I want to talk about, uh, you already heard about CDM and sectoral approaches. Uh, the story I want to talk about has to do with the electric power sector. The electric power sector accounts for about um, uh, one-third of the greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Uh, and it also has enormous potential uh, in terms of abatement potential to reduce emissions. And the reason, as you can imagine, is most of the emissions come from a combustion of uh, coal and gas uh, in power plants. Uh, you could, and there is a way to shift to using more wind, more solar, more geothermal, more bioenergy, anyway, and some nuclear power also, of course. Uh, so the potential tends to be very large. If you, uh, uh, there, there is one other segment of this, which is often ignored, and this has to do with the improvement of efficiency, not just in the power supply sector, but also in the use of electricity. In either case, you would reduce, you would reduce the amount of electricity that you need and therefore reduce the emissions uh, from power plants. And California has been a prime example of how to go about improving efficiency. And one statistic that we often cite in this state is that the per capita consumption of electricity in this state is the same today as it was in 1974, right? So per capita consumption hasn't changed. Compared to that, the consumption, the U.S. average, has almost doubled. So you see the effectiveness of efficiency as a means to keep the consumption low while at the same time let incomes rise, and which is what has happened in the state. Now, the question we often ask ourselves also is, is there some way to transfer the same approach, same technologies, same efficiency policies to other countries, other states? Not every state in the United States does this either. Uh, we have uh, a handful of states that are actively pursuing efficiency policies, uh, but there are, most of the states don't. About two-thirds of the states don't pursue any policies at all along these lines. Uh, so there's plenty of uh, opportunity to uh, transfer this type of knowledge to other countries. And last year, about, almost about a year ago now, uh, I was uh, instrumental in pulling together a, a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, between uh, California commissions, the Energy Commission and the Public Utilities Commission, and a parallel commission in the state of uh, Maharashtra in India. Uh, this is they have a very parallel regulatory system as we do in the U.S. So it's very easy to uh, maintain these kinds of, create and maintain these kinds of relationships. Now, oftentimes we sign these MOUs and they go out somewhere on the shelf. Nobody ever touches them. Uh, in this case, the difference is that the MOU provides a level of confidence to the state of Maharashtra, their regulators, their utility companies, saying, gee, somebody else has already done this. They are signing, in, signing an MOU with us. Uh, therefore, uh, we can and should be able to take advantage of the same types of actions that they have done uh, in California. Uh, and they have started doing that. So within about a three-month, four-month period in April, uh, they allocated uh, about $25 million to four utility companies uh, to begin programs on efficiency. 
And by that I mean putting up more efficient lighting, more efficient uh, refrigerators, more efficient air conditioners, improving distribution systems, and so forth. Uh, the programs are being implemented today. We are assisting them. Uh, and as this process is moving forward, other states in India have also come forward. So we just had a meeting uh, last month, and about five other states have expressed interest in uh, actively uh, being engaged and implementing similar, uh, similar programs. Uh, all this is to the good, and signing MOUs is great. Uh, coming up with targets is wonderful. Uh, but at the end of the day, somebody actually has to implement these uh, programs. And this is where the capacity is truly lacking. Now, I'll give you one uh, simple example. Uh, the utility companies in this state are also helping us do this. And so we have uh, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, uh, which is um, one of the largest companies in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, they have what's called a DSM, a Demand Site Management Program, which is focused on improving efficiency in their service area, which is the uh, Northern California Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and surroundings. Uh, they have 400 staff members who function primarily or only to promote energy efficiency on the demand side. The budget for pushing energy efficiency is about a billion dollars over a three-year period. So we are not talking about small things. We are talking about very significant resources being put into promoting energy efficiency. And the net effect is that about half the electricity demand growth is addressed through these kinds of DSM programs. How many do you think there are in the state of Maharashtra uh, trained to do these kinds of activities? So we had the regulator come out here. We asked him this question. And he said, how many do you have? And he said, 400 at PG&E. And he said, well, you'll be lucky to find four in the entire state. And so what do, what do we need to do? We need to create these kinds of partnerships. Uh, we need to have this kind of sectoral approaches, no doubt. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be engaged very heavily in promoting and building capacity and helping uh, other states, other countries, uh, in improving efficiency uh, throughout the system. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a key issue, the, the capacity issue to how fast can these programs be rolled out in, in places. Uh, uh, now move, moving uh, to uh, Dr. Yang, who's going to be talking about construction in China. And I was just really struck when somebody commented recently that I think 40 percent of China's GDP is within the, the, the construction, the great urbanization program that is, that is China at the moment. Uh, Dr. Yang. Thank you, Steve. Um, Generally speaking, the energy consumption in the building sector is account for 35 to 40 percent in the developed country. But in the developing country, it accounts uh, 10 to 24 percent. But now, uh, this energy consumption has been increased or will be increased rapidly. Uh, this is a general story, but I think our audience like me to talk more about China situation uh, in the building sector. We all know, based on our study in China up to 2030, um, about 600 million people will, will immigrate from rural area to the urban area. That is the two sides of the United States, almost more than one size of Europe. And that is a huge, you can imagine, in a city, how many houses, department, and building the Chinese needed. The China account 8% of total GDP in the world, but they consume a 35 of coal and more than 30% of the iron and steel uh, is uh, about 45 or more than uh, is about 50% of the, uh, uh, the cement and other building materials. So you can imagine, you know, if the urbanization is going so fast, every Every year is a, a, a increase about 1% to 1.2%. So here is a, we concern about the building and urbanization is not only for China. If China cannot demonstrate uh, what is a sustainable urbanization, you know, after a couple, de uh, couple decades, they have a two China population 
from the developing country will follow the China step. So we can imagine the world cannot affordable to, con uh, to have a such a uh, energy consumption. So Daniel, we are talking about the industry. And here is uh, in the building sector, if we can use all the uh, energy intensive, intensive products more efficiently, and that can reduce the burden for the industry sector. Uh, for instance, 50, more than 50% iron steel used for the building, and 70% cement for the building, and 90% of glasses or other building material uh, for the buildings. So we think that is very important. And how about China? Do you think the China, the central government and local government, they don't pay attention to the, to the building energy efficiency? No. The central government, they, they now establish a renewable law and energy conservation law. And I think in the world, only this one country have, a two, have these two very important law uh, in the world. For instance, if, if the building developer, developer, if their building have no access to other people to use renewable in a building, they will get penalty. But I don't know in, in other countries they have this such a law for new buildings. So they encourage them to use the more renewables for the building. Uh, for energy conservation law, they ask, you know, building sector or other, you know, inter sector have to have, uh, you know, standards. And we think in the building sector, standards make sense. Because if you have standards, after a couple of years, you upgrade these standards, become more restricted. So that gives a very strong signal to the developer and to the tech, uh, technology uh, vendors and they can provide a more advanced technology for the buildings. And they have a regulation, and they have incentives. So in, in here, we, we have to understand building uh, sector actually is, a, uh, is a, get a high attention in the government. But in China, we have to understand is uh, China, now the building stock and the new building almost equal. So they have a high, huge, is the demand for the retrofit for the old buildings. And we understand in the Europe, they have a slogan called Rebuild Europe. That's why they have to retrofit for the old buildings. And that's a very, very rich experience that can be used in China. Also in the US, because they have no other you know, demand for the new building, huge demand for new buildings. So I think it's a, uh, uh, that is why in the building sector and after you know, many international uh, organizations, a uh, couple, uh, couple of decades, they introduced the international best practice uh, in the policy, in the standard, uh, in the building energy efficiency standard and code. So that's uh, actually all this has been uh, uh, adopted by the Chinese central government. For the building sector we have to pay attention is another component is appliances. China almost uh, a large part of appliances China have a, a, a standards uh, for the major energy consumption equipment like air conditioning, refrigerator or others but also have a labor. But we know China have this kind of capacity. They, make, they can make all the very expensive uh, goods become much cheaper. So if we can introduce all the international technology and combine assembled uh, in the China manufacture, and it can produce the top, you know, uh, efficient and uh, very cheap the appliances to the world, that is not only benefit for China, but also for the world. So I think in this case, we, well, we understand is a building sector is the most important uh, in China. So we hope is, uh, you know, the sector approach does work uh, uh, in China. Here, you know, we have to understand what is the international best practice and trend for. So we, our statement cannot say only developing com uh, developed country can transfer their best practice in the policy making and the technology and other you know, practice, but I will say also looking at China, India, or other developing countries, 
Actually, they also have a best international practice. But because time is short, I will touch these points uh, uh, in the discussion. Six hundred million people uh, is a, it's a makes is food for thought. I believe six hundred million people. It's a huge construction project. Uh, now, Daniel, over to you to talk about energy-intensive industries and cement and steel and aluminium. Okay. Thank you, Steve, and my thanks also to the governor and to you, Secretary Adams, for making this event possible. Uh, I'd like to start by touching on a, a question that I think came up early in the panel on why sectoral approaches, and conversely why not just extend something like the EU uh, trading scheme uh, globally? And I think if from a, an economist's perspective, uh, in a pure sense, that that would be ideal. That would represent some sort of long-term vision, I think, in a world where there's international cooperation and, and global carbon prices. And, and the markets, if they're efficient, can take care of most of the things we want to take care of. But, but that's not the world we live in just yet. And so in that sense, I think we can look at these sectoral approaches in the form of, of a transition strategy. That is something that will help us uh, facilitate progress uh, from where we are to where we want to be, uh, to induce countries, both the developed and developing countries, to do more, to take on uh, more commitments, uh, harder targets, et cetera, and essentially to help navigate this transition towards some sort of long-term vision. Um, much of my work these days is working with the energy intensive industries. Uh, the Center for Clean Air Policy has a uh, generous grant from the European Commission to look at what we call proof of concept on sectoral approaches. And we are focusing on cement, iron, steel, uh, aluminum, and electric power, and in the, in the major developing countries of uh, China, Mexico, Brazil, and, and India. Uh, what we see is that um, these industrial sectors offer both opportunities and challenges. The opportunities are that they're reasonably large. If collectively they account for roughly one-tenth of the planet's uh, direct emissions, they're experiencing large and rapid growth in developing countries, as, as Dr. Yang uh, described so well. Um, they offer opportunities for progress on greenhouse gas emissions, both the, the legacy uh, infrastructure that's in place as well as the, the performance of the leading edge technologies. Uh, and in fact, many of these uh, industries are characterized by large multinational companies. Um, so all of those offer opportunities, I think, for sectoral approaches. Um, the risks that go along with some of these industries are that primarily we're looking at commodity industries. Uh, while these are energy and greenhouse gas intensive, they are also very price sensitive, uh, vulnerable to global competition. So there is at least the, the potential of uh, uncoordinated actions leading to trade shifts from an area that might have a high carbon price migrating to an area that has a low carbon price. There, that's both a jobs and an economic issue, but from a climate perspective, it's also a leakage issue, where in fact, at a minimum, you lose some of the benefits you think you might gain in the country with the, uh, the tighter standards, and in some cases, you actually increase net global emissions as a result. So there's value in coordinating efforts, again, both from the, the opportunities that are presented as well as the risk of not coordinating efforts. And uh, to their credit, the industries we're talking about here have already begun efforts, um, in some cases for several years. In the cement industry, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development has teamed with the cement industry in what's called the Cement Sustainability Initiative. Um, this has been in operation for nearly a decade. Um, in the aluminum industry, there is the um, uh, aluminium for future generations effort, also gathering data, comparing standards, looking at best practices. Uh, the cement industry, uh, I'm sorry, the steel industry has similar efforts underway. And then on the uh, public and private sector side, you have initiatives such as the Asia Pacific Partnership, which has brought together um, six or seven countries now, uh, accounting for more than half the world's output in these areas. 
and there are task forces in each of the industries we're talking about here. Uh, all of these efforts, I think, are doing a lot of the, the hard groundwork. Um, they're laying out protocols for collecting information, for measuring um, emissions, measuring energy use. Uh, they're looking at best practices. They're setting up uh, pilot projects. Um, I think this will go a long way down the road for sectoral approaches within an international context where those types of behaviors become uh, incentivized or, or monetized. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh. I think we're going to come back to this issue of, of, of how we deal with competitiveness in a fair way that's fair to developing countries, fair to the industries. It's a real challenge. All our answers welcome. Um, now, uh, over to you, and we're going to uh, have, I think you're going to have, you have a slide for us as well, do you? I do not, actually. You do not? <laughs> we, I actually we, am I'm going to be vying for the brevity award. Uh, so uh, I know there's, a, there's, a, there's an award later. Um, and so I will skip the uh, lengthy list of praise and accolades I have for this event and just thank everybody who had anything to do with pulling it together. Um, and I'm here to talk about the forest sector, uh, representing the Nature Conservancy. Um, and we know from the uh, inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that uh, actually two, two members of that panel here today that forest loss represents 20% uh, of global emissions annually, uh, and that's the second largest source uh, of emissions. So clearly any meaningful solution to this crisis has to ad address that uh, second largest source of emissions. And I kind of liken not dealing with that to trying to put out a house fire uh, while leaving the roof burning. So I think there's widespread recognition of the value of this, uh, and also acknowledgement that it can't come at the expense of reductions in other sectors. This is a, uh, uh, an addition to that. Um, and though it is a, sort of an obvious uh, uh, element of the solution, it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy. Um, there are real issues that have to be addressed to ensure that protecting forests results in real, measurable, and independently verifiable uh, benefits. That's sort of my refrain uh, in my remarks that uh, this is really a complicated challenge, but as we heard earlier, the value of transparency, uh, this has got to be held to a very high standard uh, for it to work and for our faith and confidence of markets uh, to take hold. So speaking of high standards, we know that the uh, California process for, uh, uh, for forest protocols tech took uh, many years. And the first step was to develop a foundation for credible forest carbon projects. And so in 2005, the Climate Action Registry adopted uh, a set of rigorous forest protocols that provide a standardized accounting method to measure, monitor, record, and verify uh, carbon uh, emissions and reductions from forest projects. And I think the California protocols are really important for three reasons. First off, these are arguably the most rigorous standards uh, uh, in the world. Uh, they require extremely thorough, detailed science and third-party verification. Second, they're among the first protocols developed in the world to comprehensively address the variety of forest activities, uh, reforestation, sustainable forest management, uh, to get these reduced emissions within a framework that brings accountability and integrity. Um, so these uh, protocols show how the forest sector can be a, a credible part of the, of the climate uh, change solution. And I know this uh, because last year, one of the Nature Conservancy's project was certified under these standards. Uh, about 100 miles north of San Francisco, we're working with the Conservation Fund to restore a 24,000 acre coastal redwood forest on the Garcia River. I think it was the second and largest uh, forest project certified under the new protocols and it'll uh, store more than 4 million tons of carbon over the lifetime of the project. And so by here, adhering to the Climate Action Registry's protocols and being independently certified, we're producing real measurable and verifiable emissions reductions. So while developing the protocols was a huge step forward, it's only the first step. Uh, in October of last year, the uh, Air Resources Board adopted these protocols as part of the state's plan. Uh, and though they're still uh, voluntary, the state's actions did spur investor confidence in those. We heard earlier uh, about the Pacific Gas and Electric companies 
Uh, Climate Smart Pro Program, the Garcia River Forest of the Nature Conservancy, is one of the projects that is uh, participating in that program. Uh, and I think we're seeing that uh, what's happening in California demonstrates that with effort and rigorous standards uh, in place, forest projects can uh, be a significant part of our effort. Again, they're not a substitute for reductions in other sectors, but a huge uh, companion effort to do that. Uh, so that's... Michael, thank you. Much. I mean, you've been so brief. Actually, I'm going to... Uh, we'll have a quick applause. <laughs> but just, <laughs> you, you, you're the the only point person, was to save time. The only person that's stuck to time so far. But thank you for that. But just the follow-on question, if I may, just because uh, you've got you know, great project experience with the protocol there. Um, it, do you see this as sort of... Uh, is this like large demonstration pilot phase for how to do this? Clearly. Or, yeah, I think we definitely are in that stage where, again, we've got to build the projects and the processes to get that, uh, that, uh, that verifiable, measurable result so that we can build confidence that as we scale this up, that this can be accomplished and uh, it's a meaningful contribution to the overall reductions. So, so, so I think we are definitely in the, the, the uh, early stages of this. Obviously, it's a voluntary program at this point. And do you see something different as an approach that could be applied across, let's say, the, the, the countries with major amounts of deforestation, the Indonesias and the Brazil? Yeah, again, I think the, the, the great benefit of the California example is that it, you know, it does, as I said, take into account the broad suite of forest activities, uh, not just reforestation, but, you know, uh, the, but the management of uh, productive forest lands. And a lot of the world's forests are in productive uses, and we have to be able to show that uh, you can get uh, meaningful reductions within a working landscape. So I think that's really the novelty and hopefully the model that California can serve uh, as part of this global discussion. Good. Well, we'll go to, from forestry to transport. And I think if I'm right, Drew, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but pretty much everywhere we're seeing transport-related emissions increase. There's a sort of handful of places where we've seen successful, maybe Berlin, and one or two other places where transport-related emissions have actually declined, but otherwise emissions are on the, the increase. So a sectoral approach on, on transport, if you can give us some, some hope. Sure. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Drew Kojak. I'm with the International Council on Clean Transportation. I'm the one that actually has a slide or two. Uh, we'll see if they actually appear. Um, and if not, that's fine as well. Uh, many kudos to the governor's office. Secretary Adams, thank you so much for inviting us here. Um, a word about the ICCT. Uh, the Council is made up of government officials and international experts from the 10 major vehicle and fuels markets around the world uh, that regulate vehicle emissions uh, and fuels. If anyone can show the first slide, that would be great. Ah, terrific. Uh, and what you see here is the top 10 vehicle markets uh, in 2007. They represent about 85% of the new sales of passenger vehicles and heavy trucks. Uh, and the green dots in the map above them are the location of ICCT council participants. Um, that's where we focus. We, as the staff of the ICCT, focus on providing technical and policy support uh, to those government regulators around the world to promote international best practices. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide that is relatively famous. It was uh, presented in Al Gore's uh, movie, Inconvenient Truth, uh, and it shows those nations that have either vehicle fuel economy or greenhouse gas emission programs for passenger vehicles. Uh, it is shown here in CO2 emissions per kilometer. Uh, as you can see at the low end, which is the good end, the bottom of the graphic, uh, the European Union and Japan uh, are ahead of the rest of the world in terms of having a fleet of passenger vehicles that have very, very low greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, at the top uh, are the United States and California, although I should say that uh, both the U.S. and in California are making great strides to improve their relative position in the world. Notable also are those nations that aren't pictured here. Um, Brazil and Mexico and India, all of whom are working on fuel economy or greenhouse gas emission standards but uh, have not joined this important club yet. From a best practice perspective, uh, there's two important messages to be shown here. Uh, the first is that you can do a lot more uh, than the bottom, from the bottom to the top. There's about a 
uh, a factor of two difference in the uh, greenhouse gas emissions between the best performing and the worst performing nations. That gap is uh, somewhat closing, but it does show that the technology potential and the benefits of good policy. Uh, the second important piece is you get to see which nations are actually making improvements and how fast, what is the rate of progress. Uh, and in there, California is actually the leader in the world in terms of their rate of progress. Um, I, I should be very clear. We as the ICCT, we like sectoral approaches. Uh, and we particularly like the sectoral approach from the transportation sector. Uh, and the reason is pretty simple. Uh, we like it as a complement to economy-wide cap-and-trade programs. That's because under an, a cap-and-trade cap program, the transportation sector is largely untouched, even though the types of emission reductions that are possible from that sector are some of the low-hanging fruit, uh, some of the cheapest reductions that you can achieve. Uh, and so sectoral approaches as a complement to a cap-and-trade program will allow you to achieve faster and sort of less expensive reductions than you would have otherwise. So we are very much in favor of a sectoral approach to the transportation sector uh, and one of the reasons why I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I will uh, end by just suggesting something for future discussion. Uh, California is looking into a fee-bate program as a complement to its future cap-and-trade program. Uh, I think that's something that other nations might want to think about as well. Um, but not in terms of just inspiring greenhouse gas emissions from the fleet overall, but in terms of trying to inspire uh, leapfrogging technologies. So putting a fee on the vast majority of the fleet and using those monies that are collected to rebate, let's say, the top 1 percent in terms of performance as a way of generating support and speeding the penetration of the most advanced technologies and low carbon technologies, such as plug-in hybrids, electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, et cetera. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you so much and close. I, I just, Drew, I'd be interested in your, your thoughts. I've, I've been uh, captured partially by the, the, what's happened in Europe in, uh, and in Israel. So we've had Denmark and Israel, uh, but also I think you've know, got France moving in this area, the UK is moving. Um, Israel's got a sort of national project to really push for electric vehicles, haven't they? They're, push, they're working with uh, Better Place and with others, I believe, on a sort of electric vehicle, and they've got a that their 72 percent tax, it sounds a frightening thing in America to say this out loud, a 72 percent tax on, on uh, new vehicles and it's a 10 percent tax on electric vehicles and they're putting the energy recharging grid in and basically the proposition is the gasoline vehicles dead by 2012 in Israel uh, because they're going for such a massive stimulus behind EVs. Do you think uh, there is, you know, because those, those lines are all sort of moving fairly gradually, do you think, are we going to follow that course out to 2020 or are there going to be some stronger policy pushes uh, to drive towards EVs or, or plug-in hybrids? I, I do think it makes it, the, 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 the Israeli situation is a very, fa very fascinating one and I think we're all watching to see how well that business model will actually work out. Um, I, I do think that in order to bring those advanced technologies and the lower carbon fuels into the marketplace, we're going to need additional economic stimulus. Um, how, what form that takes, I think, is, is a big question mark right now. I mean, if you were one of the states and regions here, what would your advice be? Would you be, say, be, bro be bold or would you wait? Oh, I think we are absolutely running out of time for waiting. Uh, we all have to be bold. Everybody, everybody uh, all the sort of at least the emerging markets should be on that graphic with fuel economy standards for passenger vehicles. Uh, they're necessary for heavy-duty vehicles as well. Um, Japan has led the world in those standards. The U.S. is looking into them. California is looking into them. Europe is looking into them. That's a very important next stage. Aircraft and, and marine are also looking at greenhouse gas emission standards. So those standards really need to be propagated around the world, and we need them as soon as possible. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm struck, actually, it's interesting in, on the electric vehicles that there's, there's I believe, uh, you probably know them, Dr. Young, Build Your Dream, it's called, an uh, unusual title, but in in the Pillar River Delta area that uh, was a lithium battery factory that's now going into EV uh, manufacturing electric vehicles. There's the Think project, which is sort of Norwegian-based, but actually has a modular factories. They're doing small-scale factories so that basically any, any state or region that wants an electric vehicle factory, if you're friendly to Think, they'll come and put a small modular factory actually in your state or region around the world. So I think it's something that's quite 
interesting and, and scalable there. Uh, I'd like to come back to the issue of, of competitiveness and, and uh, how that can be dealt with. And I don't, I don't know if, uh, if, if uh, Ambassador or Jan or Mark, you've got any, any thoughts on how, how we might begin to deal with competitiveness uh, through the sectoral approach. And any, any brave openers on that? Jan? Um, yes, so just, just to say that uh, at the OECD, one of the things we do to try to contribute to the conversation, the policy discussions, is some economic modeling to look at different policy instruments and their use. And of course, the competitiveness issue in energy intensive in industry has been a quite uh, sensitive or in politically important topic, particularly since Europe in its third uh, mission trading phase is actually dealing with this. Now, how are they going to deal with these industry partners? And so uh, in some of our recent modeling, what we have shown is that um, this could be potentially a very important issue, that leakage, carbon leakage or increase in emissions in these energy-intensive industries could occur outside of the boundaries of uh, the regulated area if the area that's taking action is very small. So in this case, if you look at the EU acting unilaterally, if you think of it that way, um, then it could be an important issue. If you expand uh, the post-2012 agreement um, for strong emission reductions to all of the industrialized world or even all of OECD, so including the United States, including uh, Canada, Japan, some of the important non-EU emitting countries in the industrialized world, what you see is a very small, you see a, a very rapid reduction in that leakage concern. And so the first step to take in dealing with that competitiveness issue is getting all the industrialized countries to work together. The next layer is, of course, the rapidly industrialized countries, sorry, rapidly industrializing developing countries. So that's the Chinas and the uh, Brazil's, India's of the world, that as, as they start to move into a very industrialized state, then of course there is, uh, it's important to be working together with all of the partners. But the very first step is getting all the, the OECD or the industrialized countries working together in the same direction. Thanks, Mark. Do you have a thought? Or Ambassador? And then... Maybe a short um, comment on that. Uh, this is going to be certainly one of the more challenging issues in um, the immediate future, I would say. Uh, it's obvious that as parts of the, parts of the world uh, develop um, a more carbon-constrained regime than others, uh, this unavoidable, uh, unavoidably creates some kind of distortion in the way that you don't want to see happening to your uh, companies. So carbon uh, leakage is a, it's a, uh, it's an obvious, very important preoccupation for the European Union as we lead this process of creating a carbon-constrained uh, economy and uh, area. Uh, I don't think anybody has the perfect answer to that. What we are saying is that we will look into that, because, of course, uh, carbon leakage is not really a, 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 an acceptable formula, an acceptable uh, option. The positive way uh, uh, forward is, as I mentioned briefly in my um, introduction, we have to see it in the context of a wide uh, uh, arrangement, a post-2012 approach that includes some kind of sectoral um, approaches that make sense uh, for the industry and create the perspective of overcoming uh, this kind of distortive effects that the carbon constrained economy unavoidably uh, creates. Will we be able to do that? Uh, that's what we need to do. If you allow me one uh, comment, um, yes. Uh, in a discussion uh, uh, like that, uh, you know, the, um, the risk is that uh, we leave the room with the impression that so many things are, good things are happening, uh, that we are doing what we need to do. And I think it's important to say and repeat that uh, all these things that are happening it's, are almost certain to be uh, insufficient compared to the challenge if we do not reach this post-2012 regime. Yeah? Okay. And uh, it's in that context that this thing of competitiveness uh, also will have to be uh, settled, and it's the only uh, hypothesis under which it can be settled in an acceptable way. Just a couple of comments on this. Um, we're running short on time. Mark, and then I'll go to you, Dr. Sarte, and to Dr. Young. Uh, 
I think it's important to note that, you know, any policy that creates a sense of economic disadvantage is extraordinarily difficult to get through at whatever level. We've seen that for the last seven years and ten months here in the United States, for example. And, um, you know, moving forward, where, and we do have policies in place, you know, it, all over the world for, to, you know, to stop deforestation, to build buildings properly, et cetera. They are not enforced. And a lot of cases, and unless we find some sort of mechanisms to, you know, to start making sure that this does not appear to be as much of an economic disadvantage by putting these policies in, we're going to continue to have the problem of basically of people not undertaking the, need, the activities they need to do. But, thanks, Mark. Dr. Sade? Uh, actually, I, I fully agree with what uh, Mark just pointed out. It has to do with uh, whether enforcement can actually be carried out, and it's not easy to do. If you have uh, one uh, policeman in uh, maybe 5,000 hectares of uh, forest land, very difficult thing to do. But I, but I want to point out two or three other points uh, that are probably worth bringing out in sectoral approaches. And... Um, this has to do with the um, – we all, we all understand that the emissions need to be reduced globally, fine, and uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Now, the question is how much burden should individual countries bear of these emissions reductions? And different countries use different metrics. Some use a per capita metric, some use per unit of GDP, some don't want to use biomass, etc. And that makes it difficult to set targets – uh, for these countries. The second uh, related point, I know we're running out of time, uh, has to do with the question of uh, uh, co-benefits. I think it's very, very important to understand that virtually any country would be willing to reduce its emissions if it also sees uh, other economic, other local pollution reduction benefits. And I think to the extent we can focus on those measures, we're likely to make much more progress. Last comment to you, Dr. Yeah, yeah, I would like to make a comment uh, uh, for the sector approach. Now we're talking about the technology, right? Talk about the uh, policy making, that's correct, uh, the standards. But one important missing uh, for this sector approach is uh, what is the sector structure itself? For instance, in the iron and steel, what is the difference for the China, India, the structure different with Japan, with the United States, with Europe? And that actually can save more energy than the technology itself. Great. Thank you. I'll just hand over to Linda in, in a minute to, to wrap up. But just, I, I think the, it's been a very interesting panel. We could have easily had twice as long to discuss the many issues that we've got here. I think what it focuses on that there is a new culture of collaboration, but we need to move rapidly to, to action. Uh, I'm an optimist. I believe the future around the corner is electric vehicles. It's Car, it's uh, planes on second-generation biofuels. It's low-carbon buildings. Wales has a target for 2011 to have zero-carbon buildings. So there's, there's a, a remarkable clean, green future that's just around the corner, but we need to prioritize it. Uh, Linda, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to our distinguished panel members. I think this has been a, a great discussion about the importance of sectoral approaches and how they can show a path to reductions. I think we have many, many opportunities for collaboration. Uh, California is very proud of its forestry protocol and some other protocols that it has developed. They are, they go through a very rigorous process um, and are very stringent standards and we're very much looking forward to sharing this knowledge with other countries. I think it will be uh, very valuable and um, and this afternoon, we will have panels that will delve in uh, more detail on these four different sectors that we've uh, spoken about this afternoon. So if you would uh, check your programs, they begin at um, 2.30, and we have about a half hour where you can um, look at the uh, Expo, the Climate Solutions Showcase at uh, opening momentarily in the Beverly Hills Ballroom. And, and we'll see you this evening. So thank you again. <laughs>